So I dip my toes into media analysis from time to time because I watch a lot of it and play a lot of it, and I'm better at video games than you, uh, at least with regards to Bloodborne, because I was the first one to beat it. Anyway, um, if this was some well-constructed video essay from a person who actually, you know, edited their videos, then I'd be able to accompany this with cute shorts and pictures and voice clips, but Unfortunately, because I do this off a live stream, I can't really show that much for fear of being smacked down with the copyright hammer because, again, it's being broadcasted live as I do it. So you're just going to have to be carried through this analysis by the smooth, sultry, dull set of my voice. Uh, who here has heard of Tuca and Birdie? Did I use the term dull set correctly? I think I might have misused it. No, sweet and smoothing. Okay, yeah, nice. Tuca and Birdie is a cool show. Here's a picture. It's promotional art for the show. Um, I like it a lot. It's cute. It's basically a quirky, uh, zany, postmodern, highly absurdist buddy comedy between two birds who live in Birdtown. They're gay. Not literally gay, in the case of Bird. Maybe? I don't remember. Well, nah, they're all pretty gay. It's all generally pretty gay. Also, this person's a plant. I don't know. It's a plant. So it's Birdjack Horseman. There are definitely similarities in the sense that the, um, the comedic weight of the show is usually driven by the psychological quirks and traumas of the characters. That is to say, uh, the show gets dark. And the first season got really dark, and the second season had its moments, and I like it a lot, and the second season just finished, and if you want to watch it, I watched it on Hulu. Are those flies fucking? Yes. I watched it on Hulu, uh, and you can watch it wherever. But I want to talk to you about something in season two. Didn't know there was a season two? Yeah. It got canceled off Netflix after the first season, for some reason, despite it being loved, but it got picked up by Adult Swim for the second season, which is awesome, and I really enjoyed it. So, uh, yes, that is cancel culture. Please no spoilers. So, while what I'm about to say is technically a spoiler, um, it's not really... I don't think anything that I'm about to say is going to, like, affect your enjoyment of the story. But if you really don't want to hear, then don't hear, because I'm not going to withhold from explaining any of the elements that I found interesting. The reason I'm talking about this is because there was something in the second season that I thought was kind of cool. So, the bird town that Tuca and Birdie, that's them, they're tu tu Tuca's the Toucan, tu Tuca, Toucan, Tuca, and Birdie's the one in the red sweater, Bird, Bird, Tuca, Birdie, Tuca and Birdie, uh, Tuca and Birdie. And, um, they live in, a, in a, an apartment um, on uh, adjacent floors, and they did through all of season one, but something happens in season two. And at about the midpoint in season two, uh, a conflict arises over the course of an episode, which centers largely on an allegory for gentrification. Moss takes over their building. Literal moss. I mean, green mushy moss starts to climb up the building and it starts infecting its interior and everything starts to be made of moss. The dish towel and the appliances and the floor and the ceiling and it's all made of moss. And as the building begins to be taken over by moss, it's announced that there's a new, um, a new landowner who now controls all of the rented apartments and the owner is the moss. The moss owns the apartments now. And the moss cannot speak, it can't talk, it can't think, it can't feel. It's literally just moss, but the moss has a spokesperson. A rather obnoxiously cheery uh, uh, sort of pep woman who enters the apartment to announce that rent is going up for everyone and everything is getting worse. And people complain, of course, and the woman's like, okay, I know, I know, I know, and I'll share all of your complaints and all of your concerns to my boss, but my boss uh, is moss. Uh, who ca can't hear and don't have opinions on things. So I don't, I mean, I'll try, but you know. Um, and that's kind of like the running theme where the moss just creeps and encompasses and expands more and more. Uh, and anytime people have complaints, again, it's moss. I mean, they can like rub it off stuff, but then it just grows back. And when they complain to the property manager, the property manager says, I don't know, it's moss, I don't know. And I like it. And it's a really good metaphor. Now the conflict of the um, the conflict of the episode is resolved. No spoilers. Uh, when they find a way to temporarily and only partially 
remove the moss's influence from part of the apartment. Um, but in doing so, they have to utilize the city's laws against the alteration of historical properties, i.e. some of the part of that apartment is a historical property, and uh, therefore the rent on it can't really be changed. Um, and that's how they stave it off for a little bit. And for the rest of the season, Moss controls all of that apartment, except for one little bit of it. And as the season moves forward, Moss begins to crop up more and more across the city. It starts to infect the nearby buildings as well, and you see buildings in the background that have moss growing and encompassing. And later on, uh, the moss even sponsors a big old state fair. I have no context for this, so I'm just imagining this as actual moss. It literally is actual moss. It is actual moss. It's the plant moss. And it just grows, and it owns more and more and more. And how do I say this without spoiling? In in the last episode, something happens, something uh, uh, devastating happens that wipes the moss away, somewhat literally. And I'm talking about this, and this all seems really irrelevant, but the reason why I think this is interesting is because I think that the moss is a really, really, really good analogy for the rampant expansion of capital. And that's nothing new, by the way. Uh, the idea that like a show would have a kind of allegorical representation of gentrification and of property management and what have you. But the thing that makes it cool to me is the fact that the moss is represented literally as moss and that complaints against it fall upon deaf ears because it is literally moss. Yeah, this is, this is like a tiny little screen cap, but that's the front door to their apartment. It's just, it's moss. It was brick, but now it's moss. That's moss. It's just moss now. And the reason that I really like this is because oftentimes, what we're talking about here is a very real phenomena. Oh, it's not a character, Vosh? Does it talk? No, it's just moss. The reason why I like it is because very, very, very often, um, when this sort of thing is represented in media, uh, there's an urge to personify and villainize an individual or a group of individuals for what they're doing to the city. How many sitcom plots have you seen where there's a new bad landlord or a new bad politician or a new bad property owner or a new bad property manager or whatever, and then the, the conflict is overcoming them, and then when they're gone, things go back to normal? The problem is, the, the underlying economic anxiety that's being described can't really be solved in that way because the processes people complain about, gentrification, uh, all like property being rapidly accumulated by a small handful of property acquisition firms, uh, investment, stuff like that, that isn't done because some people are evil. That is an inevitable consequence of the laws and economic principles that control our society today. This is, it has nothing to do with individuals being bad or them being indifferent or them being evil. It's just how moss grows. It's just how it is. You can complain if you want, and maybe there's a person around with an ear to turn towards you, but what are they going to say to the moss? Moss grows in environments where it's allowed to thrive. I really like this as an analogy. Because I'm a big fan of de-essentializing um, people's depictions of economic problems. So often, racism, sexism, they come up in media, but they're personified through the misbehavior of like a person or of a group. It's not capitalism that's bad. It's a corporation that's bad. And the evil corporation, once defeated, things go back to normal, you know? It's not the police as an institution that are bad. It's this group of bad cops that you can overcome, oftentimes by siding with the good cops. Racism? Racism is just a series of interpersonal actions and personal biases that can be overcome with uh, introspection and by being, you know, very socially isolatory towards people who are racist. Stuff like that. But that's not how Moss works. I mean, 
Moss doesn't care about or even know what it's consuming. It just spreads. Like anything else, like a fungus, it's completely indifferent to anything besides the conditions which enable or prohibit its growth. And again, I feel like this would all sound so much better and so much cooler um, if I had videos or pictures to show off alongside it, because that would punctuate my points. And I'd get to show you the clips where all the themes that I'm reading into are pretty explicitly described uh, in, the, in, the, in the actual text, in the actual you know, show that I'm referring to here. It's good. I like it a lot. The depersonification of evil. So much of this is systems. So much of this is utterly withheld from the individual mores and interests of people that I feel it is almost counterproductive to obsess over the idea that the people orchestrating this regime change, this transition of power, are themselves evil. Oh yeah, here we go. Thank you, um, Aina, for providing some stills. The moss is intaking the interior of the apartment, and now there's a no pets allowed policy. So this plant lady has to say goodbye to her 10 foot tall giant cat. This woman right here, the one with the little bow tie, what are they called, mascot? The little, literally a bow tie, it's like a bow, you know. Um, she's the property manager, she's the spokeswoman for the moss. And I mean, she's very cheerful and friendly about this. And sometimes she, maybe not sincerely, but at least she acts sympathetic to the people who are suffering on account of the moss's unrestricted growth. But at no point in the text is it ever made apparent that that woman has the ability to change anything. See, the moss taking over the building. As time goes on, it starts seeping towards the adjacent buildings as well. At no point in the show is it like, oh, if this lady was a little nicer or a little more sympathetic, maybe things could change. See, she's just the envoy of a natural disaster. I mean, she might as well be the weatherman reporting that a storm is coming. She's just heralding its arrival. And maybe she's, you know, a bitch about it, but she'd be replaced if it wasn't her. And ultimately, she's not responsible for anything that's taking place. Except, I suppose, in part for speaking positively of those changes. But really, the enemy is the moss. It comes to take over near the whole city towards the end of the season. Spoilers for the very end of the season. I still don't think this will influence your enjoyment of the show negatively for how absurdist and devoid of consequences it is. All of the narrative stakes in Tuca and Birdie are about the psychological growth of its characters not really about like what's happening in the world. It's an absurdist show. It's like spoiling an Ed, Ed, and Eddie episode. Like, at the end, Ed eats all of them, and they all sit in his stomach with a flashlight helmet like a miner. Okay, like, that doesn't tell you anything about the actual story, because it's all absurdist nonsense. Um, <laughs> uh, but at the very end of the second season of Tuca and Birdie, there's a great big flood, and the flood is caused in part by the fact that the moss is clogging the... Um, the um, water waste systems in below the city, uh, that they would have been functional otherwise, but instead, no. And earlier, there's dialogue which suggests that the Moss's capital investment deterred the city's leadership from investing further in its uh, natural disaster planning. And the Moss was just doing its Moss thing. I mean, it wasn't doing anything malicious. Moss grows through sewers. Anyway, the natural disaster, the flood, it washes all the moss away. The natural disaster made Birdtown inhospitable to capital investment. Isn't there something fitting about that? What corporation would buy up land in a city that had just been flooded? None. Just as a flood naturally wipes away the moss. I don't know if a flood would actually do that. Moss clings onto rocks pretty tight, but... So, too, does natural disaster and the destruction of a city disincentivize capital investment. And I think that's kind of neat, isn't it? It's not as though the flood is portrayed as a good thing. It's not. It's bad. But it also cleared the moss. And afterwards, at the end, you see people dancing up on rooftops, those who survived the flood. And I don't, it's not 
a good ending, but there's something to be said there, I think. Anyway, hopefully this uh, brief bit of media analysis completely unsupported by any clips or... Oh, I've been sent more clips. Thank you. Oh, how, uh, how, how pertinent. Thank you. Supported by not very many uh, screenshots give you uh, uh, an impression not only of why the show is good, but also why I decided to talk about this. Does that make any sense? The flood wiping away the city. And here they are eating hot dogs on their uh, fire escape ladder with their feet dipped in the floodwaters, which were apparently so severe that they were able to come 40 feet up. So, What show is this? It's Tuca and Birdie. It's a cool show. Are the gay birds going to die? I'm happy to announce the gay birds are going to be okay. And that's my analysis. That's my media analysis about the depersonification of economic woes.